Amen. Please have your seats. Mrs. Faustina Mensah, the chairman of the two of Mission 2024. Professor Mrs. Rita Akosia Dixon, the Vice Chancellor of this great university, the Pro Vice Chancellor, the Registrar, all senior members, the university chaplain, students, ladies and gentlemen. Pleasure is mine to have the stage once again and to talk about the man Jesus. Yesterday, we spoke about the fact that it is the gospel that brings the transformation. But this gospel is wrapped around the man called Jesus. So today, I want to talk about the man called Jesus. The man Jesus who brings about transformation. The reason why I'm taking the time to talk about the gospel and to teach the gospel is that I want you to have your faith firmly established in him. In the midst of the many teachings that are going on in our world today, we want you to hold on to the gospel. It is the power of God that saves. So yesterday we discussed the gospel. And why Jesus is the savior of the world who brings transformation. God formed us. We were deformed through sin, but he brought transformation through Jesus Christ. Look at this man here. He's a drunkard. He does all sorts of things. But sexual immorality, the parades on our streets, very beautiful ladies, they've sold themselves because they don't have a savior. The devil is not just interested in destroying human beings. He's, a, he's interested in destroying the world, the beautiful world that God has created. So that children will be on the streets. So that we will not have anything to eat. Our water bodies will be destroyed. Everything around us be destroyed. Look at this situation. It is only transferable... When people who are in the helm of affairs realize Jesus as Lord and they lead with the principles and values of the kingdom of God, then there will be transformation. Now, this young man was found in a ghetto. The one in green went to the ghetto to preach the word of God. And this one with the, the rasta hair gave his life to Jesus. Two months later, this is the same person. Yeah. Two months later. When we are talking about transformation, it is such like that you cannot compare the past to the present. And that's when only Jesus can do that. Look at him before and look at this man. And then he told the church that he knew how to drive a bit. So they decided to take him, take him to a driving school to polish the skills. And this is the guy. Yeah. It was it Lata, Lata Rain Driving School? He went there and then he polished up. I want you to sit back and look at this video of a young lady searching for solution. But this religious sister See this fine girl That's just waste Hey hey stop there Where do you think you are going to? I'm going to church Church? You are coming to our church dressed like this?
Ah, wow. Imagine. But people get mad. Hi. Hi. This wouldn't have happened. Hmm. This wouldn't have happened if the right thing was done. Ah. What's in the right thing? Do you know her before? This lady lost her life because of rejection. She was rejected. And this happened to her. She came to the crossroad of her life and she was looking for solution. We don't understand, sir. Sister Rebecca. Do, do you know me? Well, I don't know you. But as I was walking towards this direction, the Spirit of God revealed to me everything that transpired. Even this morning. Sister, you have disappointed God. How do you mean? Let me tell you, the blood of this lady is on your head. Jesus! Blood of Jesus! What are you talking about? W were you people not here? Did I not meet you here? Am I part of this? Oh God, watch your words now. This woman just walked in here. Exactly. But this is a very serious statement. <laughs> in fact, sir, we day here before she comes. Yes! Yes! Well, you people will not understand. I know what I am seeing in the spirit. Madam, can I ask you? Can you just remember what happened some hours ago? Can you remember how you treated this lady when she came to your church this morning? Good morning, Mom. Brother, you're welcome to church. Thank you, Mom. Sister, you're welcome to church. Thank you. Hey, hey, stop there. Where do you think you are going to? I'm going to church. Church? You are coming to our church dressed like this? Take a look at yourself. Oh, you think you can go to club last night and come directly to church in the morning? Or you want to come and seduce brothers in church? Isn't it? It will not work for you. I know your type. It will not work. You cannot come here to defile the atmosphere of God's presence. Sinners like you are not needed here. Please leave this place. You mean I should leave? Yes, leave. If you want to come to church, go back home, dress properly before coming to church. I cover my husband's eyes with the blood of Jesus. This girl came to your church to seek for Jesus. She came to your church to find peace. But instead of you to help her, you were so judgmental. You condemned her and you pushed her away. The church is not a place of judgment. Neither is it a place of condemnation. The church is a place where the frustrated comes to have peace. The church is a place where a wounded soldier comes and receives healing. But instead of you, to heal the wounds of wounded soldiers. You add salt to them. She was frustrated, looking for solution. She needed peace. She had no place to go to. And she came to church to find peace. Solution. And she was and the rejected. Is not church. Because you felt... It's not religiosity. The problem we have in Africa today... Let me say again, is that we are too religious, but our religiosity is not being transformed to spirituality. There's a big gap between what happens on Sunday and what happens on Monday. This is Dickness, uh, what her name is, Sarah. Rebecca, very, very judgmental. She thinks that salvation is in the way she has dressed. 
and that this one cannot be in church. If she has to be in church, she has to go back and dress well and come to church. And she never had the opportunity to go dress and come back to church. She denied her of Jesus, the Savior of the world. The priest is saying that this woman, lady was coming to church to look for Jesus. This evening, our focus should be on Jesus. I even want to advise pastors here and the ministers of the gospel. The focus of service is not on you and how you are dressed. Not on what you have, but on Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Savior of the world. Today, I want to focus your attention on the man, Jesus. And I want to, you to underline the fact that Jesus became a man. Why did he become a man? Why the man, Jesus? You see, when man fell and was deformed, the greatest denier was not his being evicted from the Garden of Eden, no, because God knew that man, with the wisdom and knowledge that he has granted him, can come back to the Garden of Eden. Because he banished him from the Garden of Eden. But man could come and still walk around the Garden of Eden. The greatest denier was that God made sure that an angel holding a sword came to guard the tree of life. So when we are talking about salvation, salvation is accessing life. That tree of life that was denied, through Jesus Christ, we have accessed that tree. So if he, man came back to the Garden of Eden to eat of that tree, he will live forever. And ladies and gentlemen, the life that we have obtained from Jesus Christ is eternal life. Life forever. So this evening, the only person that can give you access to the tree of life is the man Jesus. He is the transformer. Otherwise, all of us formed by God have been deformed because of sin. But today, if you give your life to Jesus, he will transform your life. Hallelujah. The man Jesus. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Isaiah 7 verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And we'll call him Emmanuel. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And we'll call him Emmanuel. See, the Christian faith rests on two key beliefs. One at the beginning of the Jesus story. And the, the second at the end of his story. Or the, his life. The belief at the beginning is the incarnation, God becoming man. And the belief at the end is the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. These two events, Christmas and Easter, ought to be celebrated. Why? Because they distinguish Christianity from all other religions. Christmas is a celebration of the birth of Christ, God becoming man. Then, the Easter, it is when Christ died and resurrected. And I'm saying that there should be no generation that should play with these two events. They are significant to our belief and Christianity. Today, I will talk about the first event. God becoming man. God becoming man. 
This is the true wonderful story ever told. It all began on the day when God came in the flesh. The day the Son of God was born by a virgin named Mary. Now, I shall attempt in this presentation to prove the virgin birth from Scripture. I will emphasize how the virgin birth makes Jesus a unique human and the savior of the world. I shall look at the importance of the virgin birth to our celebration. Then, I will call upon you to respond to this love of God by giving your life to Jesus. That if you are a Christian, I want you to hold on to the one you have believed firmly with your two hands like that. My earnest prayer for you is that you prepare a place for him in your heart and may the earth get ready to receive their king. I want to pause a bit. Somebody can help me sing joy to the world. Joy to the world. Let's put our hands together for our sister. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let us receive her King. for you tonight is that you prepare him a place in your heart and may the earth receive her 
king. A virgin will have a son. Is it true that a virgin has ever given birth to a son? Is there evidence su sufficient to establish this claim that a virgin actually gave birth to a son? The redemption story, I've said, is the true wonderful story ever told. The birth of Jesus was different from any other. To the extent that this is how the Apostle Paul described it. 1 Timothy 3 verse 16. 1 Timothy 3 16 says that, Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. The mystery of godliness, Paul says that is great. In Matthew chapter 1, Matthew takes us to the beginnings. Now, the, Jewish, the Jews always kept an extensive genealogy to establish a person's heritage, inheritance, and legitimacy, and rights. To the extent that when some of them returned from Ezra, those who claimed to be priests and whose names were not found in the genealogy of the Levitical priesthood, they were refused to become priests. They were so interested in that, they kept records. And Matthew thought that he should take us to the beginning when he was trying to let us know that Jesus is connected to Abraham and to David. So let's go to Matthew chapter 1. And I want all of us to carefully follow the reading. Matthew chapter 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Next verse. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Now take note of the father of the father of Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Now, he's just trying to let you know that this Tamar, despite who she was, he still can be found in the ancestry of Christ. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Verse 4. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Verse 5. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. Let's take verse 6. And Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother has been Uriah's wife. His mother has been Uriah's wife. For the sake of time, let's jump to verse 12. Verse 12. After the exile to Babylon, they still kept records. Jeconai was the father of Shaltai, and Shaltai the father of Zerubbabel. Let's jump to verse 16. Now, this is the big one. I want you to pay attention to this. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, comma, the husband of Mary, comma, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Now look at that. I will take it again. And Jacob was the father of Joseph. Ordinary, if we were to follow the pattern, it should have been Joseph, the father of Jesus. But look at how Matthew decided to paint this one. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, comma, the husband of Mary, comma, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. What is going on here? 
Here we find a repeated kind of formula. A is the father of B. B is the father of C. C is the father of D. D is the father of that. But when it came to Jesus, there seems to be a deviation, a departure from the norm. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the, ma the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Here we have a record of a birth without a father. Now hold that one to your spirit. Now because of this deviation, it compelled Matthew to throw more light on verse 16. Why the deviation? So let's go to verse 18. Verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother, Mary, was plagued to be married to J Joseph. Because before they came together, she, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Very, very mysterious. Now, heaven was so strategic. So that the enemies of Christ will not be able to say and to say and to say and to accuse the mother or Christ of being an illegitimate child. So heaven was very, very strategic. When heaven was always watching, always watching. And when this man betrothed Mary, heaven intercepted so that Joseph could be a cover of what was going to happen. Let's go to verse 19. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her pride quietly. The next verse. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her, in, in her is from the Holy Spirit. How many men here will be convinced by this? Your wife is pregnant. And an angel comes to tell you that, don't worry. What is conceived is from the Holy Spirit. How many men here will take that lightly and will even believe the dream? Now let's move on to the next verse. What is the reason for this kind of conception? Verse 21. She will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. Because he will save his people from their sins. This is all the reason for that kind of conception. Verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet. Verse 23. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Let's pay attention to 24. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. Maybe the men here should put their hands together for Joseph. You see, one of the people that when we get to heaven, people will be eager to see is Joseph. I'm sure they're men. But you see, for me, the test that really surprises me is the next one. 
25. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him, he, Joseph, gave him the name Jesus. Joseph never slept with Mary. From the day he had that dream and took her to, the, to, her house, to his house, he never had any sexual intercourse with Mary. So that he may not have the idea that maybe he's my son. And for me, I think that the angels might have done something to Joseph. <laughs> I, I always suspect so. I, I'm not sure that, you see, as for human beings, you have to control them. And a man and a wife, nine months maybe plus, so I'm sure that before Gabriel left, or Bonipane, <laughs> It's only a few awkward. <laughs> but all this is in scripture. Now, I'm talking about Jesus, God becoming a man. God becoming a man. As for Dr. Luke, he gave careful details of the story and therefore supplies some flesh as to what really happened. Luke chapter 1. I want you to just take time and relax and enjoy the scriptures. He says that in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth to a town in Galilee. Now, let's jump to verse 29. Twenty-nine. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greetings this might be. The next verse. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. 31. You will conceive now and give birth to a son and you, and you are to call him Jesus. Now I will take this version from the ESV. This one is saying that you will conceive. We all con women conceive. So if we say you will conceive, it's not so much of something that is wonderful. But let's look at how this version puts this same verse. And behold, you will conceive in your womb. We all know that we conceive in our womb. But the emphasis of the womb is to let her know that there is not going to be any penetration. The conception will take place in the womb. And bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. You will conceive in your womb. Now, he will be great. Verse 32. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. Then Mary questioned, verse 34. 34. Shall we all read together if you can? And Mary said to the angels, How will this be, since I am a virgin? So all these things was happening to somebody who knew that she was a virgin. And then she was saying that how? Now if you are questioning how, then you are querying the method, the manner. So the woman is saying that, what method? Because on this part of the world, if you don't know a man, you can't conceive how the method. And the angel said, you see, don't worry about this things. Those of you living on this part of the universe, these things are a problem to you. But from where I'm coming from, all things are possible. Yeah. You just believe. Believe. And they say the Holy Spirit will come upon you. That is why what you are going to give birth to will be called the Son of God. And Mary said, 
I can't argue with you any longer. I am God's servant. Let it be to me, just as you have said. Today, in the name of Jesus, I pray that something will happen to you. Just open your spirit. May you receive the healing in the name of Jesus. If you believe that, shout amen. amen. Open up and may you receive it just as your faith is. Please receive it in the name of Jesus. Now, for the sake of time, The angel told Mary for a proof that what I'm telling you will certainly come to pass. The woman, your cousin, the one they used to call Byron Elizabeth is in her sixth month of pregnancy. Go and check. Because with God, all things are possible. That was for a moment. But what is the proof that Jesus was born by a virgin? Luke chapter 2 verse 28. And I want to say that Jesus referred to God as his father, not to Joseph as father. Luke chapter 2 verse 48. When his parents saw him, this was when they went to Jerusalem and Jesus slipped to the temple. They looked for him for three days. When eventually they saw him, this is the record. They were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Take note of your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Let's listen to this 12-year-old child. How is going to respond to your father and I have been anxiously searching for you? Why were you searching for me? He asked, that is Jesus. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? When your father and I are searching for you, and then you are saying that I am in my father's house. Now, let's go to the next verse, verse 50. But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Not that they didn't understand. They were puzzled. How? How can you not understand my, your father and I, and the man says that, didn't you know that I should be in my, that, uh, in my father's house? And between the two of them, they understand what the young man is saying. Only that they wonder who told him. So they were kind of puzzled. But look at the mother, the next verse, 51. Then he went down to Nazareth with them anyway. And was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. She kept pondering over them. Number two. Jesus never referred to Mary as mother. She never did. If you know any scripture where Jesus actually referred to Mary as mother, you can let me know. Can give you that space but so far as my search is concerned he never did refer to mary as mother john chapter 2 this was at the wedding ceremony when the wine was short and the mother went to request of jesus to help on the third day a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Now, this is the writer saying that Jesus' mother was there. No problem. Verse 2. 
And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. The next verse. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Verse 4. Woman. <laughs> Woman, not mother. Woman. Why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. Woman. Hold that one. Maybe this one was asleep. Let's go to John chapter 19. Verse 25. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So about four Marys. When Jesus saw his mother there, this is the writer saying that when Jesus saw his mother there, because this one, has been kept by Mary, Joseph, and maybe Elizabeth and Zachariah. They handled this issue very well. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. Maybe Jesus, he doesn't know how to pronounce pronounce the word mother or that is why he keeps saying woman but let's move on to the next verse 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 27 and to the disciple here is your mother from that time on this disciple took her into his home so when he was speaking to the mother he said she, he said, woman. And then to the disciple, he said, this is your mother. So after all, he, he, he knew how to say mother. But he never referred to Mary as mother. The man Jesus. Jesus knew that he wasn't from the earth. And actually spoke about it. To the amazement of the disciples. John chapter 16, verse 28. Are we together? Now, this is Jesus. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now, this is the man making a, a very strong statement. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now, I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Now listen to the disciples, the next verse. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you are speaking clearly without figures of speech. What does that mean? They have always thought that there is something about this man. Because they know that this is their mother. And then he is from Nazareth. But sometimes his actions... And his dealings mesmerizes them. Now they know human beings do not walk on water. So when they saw a human being walking, something walking on water, they took that person, that thing, for a ghost. While they were screaming, he said, hey, don't worry, it is me, Jesus. And people said, what? What? Jesus? Yes. Jesus, you wait for me. And then the man was walking on water, going to where they were. Then Peter said, are you sure it is you? He said, yes. If, you, if it is you, then let me also come. Then Jesus said, come. Then Peter stepped on water, stepped on water, stepped on water. Then Peter was saying, hey, me pan, I mean, I mean, so see. <laughs> now, when he was about drawing, Jesus held his hand and they went back to the canoe. Now listen. I'm sure when he gets into the boat, all eyes will swing to where he is. And then they will turn their eyes back. One day he was fast asleep. 
and the billows rose. The storm raged against them. And then they woke him up. Master, don't you care that we perish? Then when he woke up, he just lifted up the hands and he said, peace be still. And the storm ceased and he went back to sleep. I'm sure that when he went back to bed, they came and stood there and they watched him. That is why they said, what manner of man is this one? What kind of a human being is this? So they have always suspected that there's something about this uh, Joseph's son. So when he said, I came from heaven and I entered the world, they said, today you are speaking clearly. And now we know that you know all things. That is what they said. If they say that we know that we, you know all things, then they are saying that we know that you are God. We know that you are God. Please hold on to this truth and preach them for us. Don't let anybody come with any different gospel. God became man. God became man. I came from heaven and entered the world. Now, Jesus claimed to be the son of God. Matthew, Mark chapter 14, verse 61. Mark 14, 61. But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one, the son of God? Now, many were the accusations leveled against Jesus in his trial. Most of them he didn't answer, even to the amazement of Pilate himself. But this one, he answered. So let's listen to his answer. I am, said Jesus. And you see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. What was the question that was asked him again? Let's go back to 61. But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One, the Son of God? Jesus' answer, I am. So I'm not the son of Joseph. I am the son of God. Who told him? I am the son of God. Now listen. Verse 63 says that the high priest tore his clothes. Why do, why do we need any more witnesses? He asks. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Now it was this confession that I am the son of God. That took him eventually to the cross. But the mother was around. Why did the mother sit looking on? So this man was crucified. Because he has said he is the son of God. The mother should have run to Pilate. And should have run to the others and said, Don't mind him. Who told him that he is the son of God? But the mother couldn't say that. Oh dear, John, 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 sir. And this young man was killed on the cross because he claimed that I'm the son of God. Now listen. Scripture says that when he sh shouted it is finished and the blood from his side touched the ground, the earth shook, graves were opened and there was this soldier standing by the cross, the one who actually pierced him. He looked at all that happened. And this is what he said. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Surely he was the Son of God. But this time he was gone. But listen, why should God 
come in flesh. You see, Jesus said, I entered the world. He's just trying to say that, in fact, I'm not part of this world system. I don't belong to the human race. He is not a person that the human race can actually take pride in because he entered the world. He is not like the same boat that we can all say that this is a human who is fast. But this Jesus was a different kind of a man. Now, you can enter this world if you don't go through a woman's womb. That is the only visa that a, a man or a woman can enter this world. But God is spirit. And for God to be able to become like us, he needed a womb so that the womb will give him body. Hebrew says that you, God, you are not interested in, the, in animals, the blood of bulls and donkeys and all that. No, you are not interested. So a body you prepared for me you prepared a body for me. That is Hebrews 5. So God prepared a body for Jesus. Why did he need a body? Number one, he needed a body because the human race has sinned and all of us has fallen short of the glory of God. So anyone that is born into this system is a sinner. So he, being God and not part of this system, then has a right to save us because he is not a sinner. But he just came through the woman's womb and took upon him a form of a servant as a human being so that with that form, he can save us. So now we have a savior outside the human race. Who took upon him the human form? That is the formula that God used. So that this one too will not be, will not be said to be a sinner. Because the Bible says that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So Christ comes outside humanity and then took upon him a form of a servant. Why did he also needed to be, to have a body? The scripture says that the Messiah will be born of a woman, not a man and a woman. That was fulfilled in Christ. Now, so that the Messiah will suffer. Because the requirement of the salvation is that the Messiah must suffer. Now, if you have to suffer, then you need this body to be beaten, to be battered. So you can suffer and feel the pains that human beings feel. Now, the another point is also that so that he will be able to shed blood. God is spirits and spirits do not have blood. Now for him to be able to shed blood for the remission of sins, he needed to have flesh. So that in the flesh, there will be blood. So that he will shed the blood so that our sins will be forgiven. Because without the shedding of blood, there will be no remission of sin. So Jesus needed a body. Now, he needed a body. Eventually, he died. He died. And before he died, it's as if he had a checklist on the cross. This is done. This is done. This is done. This requirement is met. This one to his met. This one to his met. It is finished. Tetelesta. It is finished. And once he finished it, now listen. Hmm. Jesus entered the world as the second Adam, giving us the probability that there could have been a third Adam. If he failed, God might have sent another one. You see, Jesus was tempted in every way. If the devil knew that Jesus could not sin, he wouldn't have tempted him. But once he put on this human nature, he had the same feeling that we all have. 
And the devil tempted him. But he went through all this without sin. And everything that the Messiah was supposed to do to qualify to be the Savior, he passed all of that. And then he said, it is finished. And heaven held onto it. And something happened. God passed a new law. From that day, God passed a new law. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. I want to take it from the King James, if you have the old man. There is therefore no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Why? Verse 2 is the big one. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Up until this time, there was a law called the law of sin and death. It was passed in the Garden of Eden. The action of man brought this law so that every soul that sins dies. So this was a kind of a law. The law of sin and death. But on the cross, when Jesus met the requirement, God passed a new law. It is called the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Um, let me make this illustration and then I'll call you to respond. Are there young men here? Yes, please come. I'll need three of you. Three of you. Let's clap for them. Yeah. So you will be here. You will be in the middle. You will be this way. Come, just be on. Put your hands on their shoulders. No, this one. Many years ago, we used to have the law of slavery. So this is the law of slavery. Because of this law, the white man, this one in white, white, white man, had all the rights because of this law of slavery to come to Africa to take this black man to work in his plantation. Is that right? One day, another law was passed that abolished the law of slavery. So this law is no longer there. This one keeps working on this man's plantation. His interest is that this one will never know and hear that the law has been abolished. So what the devil, what he will always do is to keep this man away from the news and keep him ignorant that he shouldn't be working for him because a new law has been passed. He is free, but he doesn't know. Let's go back. But one day, while working on the plantation, a once slave saw him. Why are you still here? He said, Shh, my master is there. He said, hey, no, no. You are not supposed to be here. And then this one showed him the, new, the, the, the newspaper that the new law has been passed. What should he do? He should just throw his cutlass and his machete away and jump away from the plantation. 
jump away from the plantation. What can he do? He can't do anything because the law is on his side. Hey. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus yes. has been passed. It has set us free from the law of sin and death. Hmm. Because the God became man. Everything that needed to be done to the sinner, he allowed himself to go through it to the extent that he was cursed that we might be blessed. He was hung on the tree for us, our sins. And God has passed a new law. Now what the devil can do to keep you still under his claws is ignorance. But today I came to tell you that Jesus has set you free already. On the cross over 2,000 years ago, a new law has been passed. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now listen. Everyone's sin has been fully purchased for. All you need to do is to respond by confessing Jesus as Lord. Now the mystery is this. Please you may sit down. How many of you are free slaves now? Let's put our hands together for the slaves who are free. Now listen to me brothers. You know that I have said that what actually took Jesus to the cross was when he confessed that I'm the son of God, right? It is this same confession that you also have to do to be made a child of God. He confessed it, he was crucified, but when you confess it, you'll be set free. John 20 verse 31. John 20 31. Shall we all rise to our feet please if you can? As we take this reading, John 20, 31. If you can, if for any reason you aren't able to do that, don't worry. But if you can, my greatest prayer, that all of us who are born again will not shift an inch from the gospel of salvation. Our faith in Jesus must be so strong and we must know what we have believed and who we have believed the man Jesus. Shall we read this together if you can? But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. When he confessed that he was the Son of God, he was crucified. But tonight, if you believe, you have life in his name. I want you to lift up your hands now. Let us bless this Jesus. Let us bless him. He came to give us life. He paid the debt that he did not owe. Oh.